evening. If you'll open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6, we'll be in Daniel chapter 6, and we will discuss one verse of the Bible, Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. But this is a very full and meaningful verse. Uh, whenever I was in school many years ago, we had a, a preacher boy, as they called us, from Tyler, Texas, named Cogburn. His name was Glenn Cogburn, but he wasn't quite five foot tall. And he was a little bandy rooster. He was the most enthusiastic fellow I ever had, ever have met. And he loved the movie True Grit, and he wanted to be called Rooster Cogburn. He was a terrible fit. He was no John Wayne at all, but he was uh, uh, just a feisty young fellow. And, and a story I was told reminded me so much of this spiritual young man uh, whenever uh, a church was looking for a preacher and they had a fellow come through and he did a great job and preached a wonderful sermon and seemed like a very fine individual and very spiritual, but he wasn't quite five feet tall. He's really an awfully short fellow. And one of the brethren asked one of the elders, just how tall should a preacher be? And the elder gave the right answer. He said, well, I figure he's got to be tall enough to reach heaven from his knees. We all need to be able to reach heaven from our knees. And if anyone got there, it was Daniel. What an example in prayer is Daniel. If you think about being a Christian, prayer is the quintessential activity. We are here, according to Ecclesiastes, to fear God and keep his commandments is the whole duty of man. If we are here to praise God and to show his way is best, how can we possibly praise him unless we are in communication? Our prayers are are so key to our spiritual lives. And those are the areas that probably we all feel the most need for growth in. Remember, that's the question Jesus' disciples asked him after they had been with him for quite some time. Lord, teach us to pray. And we still need those lessons. Daniel gives us some beautiful lessons here in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. He was loved by God, hated by man. The princes of Babylon wanted his overthrow in his life, and they used politics as some do. I'm reminded of John, John C. Calhoun. Actually, John C. Calhoun reminds me of the satraps of Babylon who's going to get themselves a law passed that is going to destroy the enemy. Because John C. Calhoun was the one who passed what was called the Tariff of Abominations. He's the one who recommended that, was the power behind having that passed in order to destroy John Quincy Adams' presidency. The John Quincy Adams could neither sign it because it was such a terrible tariff and it would destroy his presidency and his chance for re-election. Or if he vetoed it, he'd lose all chances for re-election because he'd lose the support of the Northeast. John Quincy Adams, that Calhoun could not imagine John Quincy Adams signing it and sacrificing his political career. But he did. And Calhoun cut his own throat politically by doing that. These satraps come up with a law to say that no one can pray to any man or God save Darius. And if they, are, they do, they'll be thrown in a den of lions. Daniel, still knowing the decree is passed, yet we read, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, now his windows were open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, and he kneeled upon his knee, knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God 
as he did aforetime. Let's notice six things about this prayer very quickly. I promise not to spend 10 minutes on each one. This prayer was secret. He didn't go out to the street corner. He didn't come out and say, please arrest me. Here I am. I'm the holiest man of all Babylon. Come along. I'm looking forward to persecution. No. He went into his chamber. He was always in his chamber. Just as Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6. But when you pray, go into your inner room. And when you've shut the door... Pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. God gives us his strength without an audience. We don't need an audience for that. God takes good care of us. You know, Jesus didn't have all of his disciples around him when he prayed his most painful prayer in Matthew the 26th chapter we read in verse 36 Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples sit here while I go over there and pray and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed and he said to them my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death remain here and keep watch with me and he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed saying my father if it is possible let this cup pass from me yet not as I will but thou wilt even Jesus needed to be alone to pray if we were to do an honest inventory of ourselves men would we have spent more time in prayer alone or in praying at the meal times and praying with our families and praying in public we know how that column should add and if we're the people we need to be we need to spend more time in prayer all of us need to spend more time in prayer None of us is praying enough, are we? But this was a secret prayer. It was also definitely a prayer of faith. It was a believing prayer. His windows were open toward Jerusalem. Now, he was living with the conceptions that he had, but the faith he had was deep. He knew that there was a God in Jerusalem where God's name was recorded, even though the temple was to be destroyed and may have been destroyed by this time that didn't matter he knew his father had not not betrayed not forsaken Jerusalem entirely he wanted to pray where the sacrifices were offered He's not the only one who thinks this way. It's not that God said and gave a command, you're going to have to orient yourselves toward Jerusalem. That's the way you've got to pray. But they understood that the sacrifice was needed and they needed that atonement that was made at the temple. They needed to, to address themselves to the very presence of God and his mercy seat, his propitiation, his the Greek word that is translated propitiation is actually the word mercy seat for that part of the Ark of the Covenant where the blood was sprinkled. That's the place where heaven's love and heaven's mercy meet, like the trysting place as the song talks about. Jonah said the same in Jonah chapter 2 and verse 4. So I said, I have been expelled from thy sight. Nevertheless, I will look again to thy holy temple. Now, where did he have a compass? In the belly of that whale. But yet, whether he could see what direction it was, he was thinking about God's presence and forgiveness and God's special relationship that he had with us. It doesn't have to be toward Jerusalem. But we've got to be sure we are showing our faith in God by praying. 
1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, Paul reminds us he wants men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. James reminds us if you lack wisdom, what are you supposed to do? We've got to pray, don't we? James chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, But if any lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Let him ask in faith. Without doubting, for the ones whose doubt is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. It's got to be a prayer of faith, pointing toward the real Jerusalem, that place in heaven where our prayers go. It was also a prayer that was reverential, respectful worshipful he's not a teenager anymore he'd proven his love for God as a teenager by following a diet a very very simple diet and flourishing and staying away from the king's dainties he'd he'd already done so much in prophesying for the king he's he's turning into an old man and I I, I have yet to be at a church of Christ building if we can call it that with kneelers that we didn't buy from someplace else but this man felt the need to bow his knees. He knelt. Paul knelt. Ephesians chapter 3, three verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. The knights of the Middle Ages bowed their knees in respect and adoration Does anybody know John Wesley's nickname he spent every day from 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. in prayer and it showed he had a nickname he prayed so often on his knees he was so calloused those who knew him well called him old camel knees well, I'm not suggesting there is one attitude or one posture of prayer that the Bible approves more than others. I uh, never knew my father to kneel in prayer, but he was a very obese man. And uh, I do understand when he was a young radical preacher, he actually led some prayers from his knees before the congregation. And that'd be okay. It's our heart that's got to be on its knees. It's our attitude that we've got to understand who is the greater. We're here talking to God. While we come before his throne with boldness, we are the sinners. <laughs> we are the supplicants. We're the ones who are the weaker. And we are going to the God of the universe and able to pray and talk to him. Fourth, this prayer was habitual in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. Three times a day as a four time. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with a habit, do you? Penny tells me I love you every morning when we get up, and I tell her I love you. But I try to beat her to it once in a while. And I don't think it's lost any meaning. Every now and then we find a better way to say it. Is that the way your relationship is? I hope it is. I have to watch out because every now and then if she's upset it with me, my first answer is, you know I love you, baby. And she's going to tell me, uh, I really want to discuss this and I'm glad you love me, but uh, that, that's not going to solve the problem yet. But is it less meaningful for being said more often? I don't think so. Prayer does not begin to lose its impact the less we do it. It's something that grows and builds the more we, time we spend doing it, the more often we do it. That habit's a good thing. You know, I shaved this morning, and I need to start a habit of shaving twice a day. I really, you know, my father said he had to do that, and I believe it now that I'm his age. Uh, when he passed away, yeah, it, it's pretty, pretty scratchy. 
There's nothing wrong with waking up in the morning and taking a shower. I wish every one of my students would do that. They'd, there's nothing at all wrong with filling the gas tank when it's half empty. I think that's a good habit to be in. I wish my sister had always had that habit. Uh, there's all kinds of wonderful habits that we do. I think three meals a day are a good thing. It, it, it's, it's wonderful, and I'm in that habit. How about you? Those are great things. And I loved when my children were in the habit of attacking me when I got home. It was no less meaningful every day. And whenever those hugs got a little less frequent, that kind of hurt, doesn't it? You remember those times, don't you? And we look back on them with fondness. The Lord's Day, it's a habit. Daily prayer, it's a habit. Giving every week, I hope, is a habit. Those things are great. God, prayer to God ought to be habitual. It ought to be a lifestyle and something we can't imagine making a major decision without going to the Lord. We can't imagine finishing our day without praying to the Lord. We can't imagine eating our meal without praying to the Lord. Fifth, I told you six. Fifth, this was a prayer of gratitude. He was grateful. How does that make sense? He gave thanks to God as a four time. When he knew the writing was signed. Dear Lord, thank you for... I'm thankful. They're about to arrest me and I'm going to become lion chow. But thank you. Do you have trouble being thankful in all circumstances? I think we need to stretch our imagination sometimes to see what there is to be thankful for. No matter what our circumstances, God is good. The circumstances aren't necessarily good, but God is. There's always something to give thanks for. And even if you're facing a death penalty, he found, Daniel found something to be sincerely thankful for. He gave thanks and gave praise to God somehow or another on his way to the lion's den, knowing his enemies had gotten the better of him. Yet, he still prayed. He knew where his blessings came from. Gratitude is an essential element of joy. There is no joy without gratitude. Rejoice in the Lord always, Philippians 4 verse 4 says. And again I will say rejoice. Let your moderation be made known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God without thanksgiving we really can't have the joy we need no matter how difficult the circumstances are I cannot imagine that Daniel said absolutely nothing to the Lord about this decree and yet his prayer was a prayer of thanksgiving as we throw our cares on him, for he careth for you. As we throw the load, we need to remember to cast our thanks with it. And we'll remember God has done for us in the past. And we can have faith that he will in the future. Finally, and I do mean this not in a Pauline way. Finally, this was a courageous prayer. This was a prayer made at the cost of his life, as far as he knew. He sounds a lot like Peter, doesn't he? And the rest of the apostles, when in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. 
he knew that decree was signed and they knew his windows were open perhaps they saw him but it's his upper room did they hear him it seems to me they they must have he wasn't praying to be heard by them but they were able to testify he's praying he's got his windows open and he's giving thanks to God still doing it three times a day When he knew how are we doing on our prayer life I doubt we're measuring up quite as well to Daniel as we would like I'm not gonna ask you to tell me how many times you pray and how long you pray and and fill out some kind of a log it wouldn't hurt you probably for your own benefit but I don't want to know I want you to be praying on your own secretly make sure that you're getting credit for it because if we're seen of men we have our reward in full is your prayer trusting in God are you believing that God really can and will do something to change your lives what a what a miserable existence it must be for those who think somehow or another God prayer is only for us and and just an exercise in praise and we shouldn't ever ask for anything physical because somehow we'll set ourselves up for disappointment what a miserable existence and how we cheat ourselves God does care about our lives and those of us who are paying attention and praying we know of some of the things he's done for us don't we God has taken care of us and answered some of our prayers just the way we asked and some things we wouldn't have if we hadn't asked are we giving God his full respect are we praising God at the beginning of our prayers and realizing that we while we are talking to someone who loves us and care for us are talking to the maker of all things and the one who one day will destroy them as well are we still in a habit and are are we living with an attitude of gratitude have that courage it takes to pray no matter what not to be seen of others but no matter what the cost as well most of us have a great benefit we're still looking to Jerusalem no, I, I don't mean get on your knees to the east bow your face to the east and let's all have a, 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 a someone call us from a minaret somewhere and let's all pray in that direction because Mecca is kind of close there you know they'd, they'd be pretty close on the compass we'd, we'd only get a, a point or so difference from here no 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 but are we praying toward heaven we can if you're a child of God if you've submitted to Christ in baptism If you've had your sins washed away, you're one of his children and God wants to hear from you and promises your forgiveness with only we ask. If only we repent and we ask. As we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus' his son cleanses us. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. Let's keep taking advantage of that. Never stop asking the Lord's forgiveness. Perhaps our biggest problem is forgiving ourselves once we've asked. But if we can pray with you and for you, we'd love to do that for whatever need you might have. But if there is anyone with us who's never named the name of Christ tonight and needs to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, the waters are prepared and we're all eager and we sing to encourage you to make that decision. So if you're subject to Christ's invitation, won't you please come while we stand and while we sing?